Uh, just a reminder to start with, research is basically some sort of tool to explore reality, to explore reality as it is, as opposed perhaps to some preconceived ideas. This is the generally accepted definition of basic research, and it is often used to change reality in what is called applied research. Now, basic research as an exploration of reality is not necessarily linked to particular needs. And it seems to be accepted by society in many, many cases if funding requirements are small. I haven't heard about people wanting to do away, at least not society at large, doing away with uh, research in literature or research in some fields of mathematics where there is no, uh, no immediate application or philosophy or, or political science or whatever. If funding requirements get large, then there is a problem. The reason, there are a number of reasons that could be mentioned. One of them would be because applications are often found later. And uh, this in particular is true of mathematics, where there was a lot of research that was, that was done uh, without any application in mind, and then it turned out it was useful. How about another possibility which might appeal to Andrew Chesterman, because there is some kind of an intrinsic human thirst for knowledge and understanding, which may again come in uh, and contribute to society. Or, because of social inertia, because it exists and it may take a shock because people, before people can change things, even if, think, even if they think that the things are not useful. Now, if we talk about applied research, I'm referring, of course, to the, to the three questions that were asked by you. <clears throat> applied research is used to change reality, ideally to improve it, big question mark. Does it improve it, or does it serve the interests or ideologies of some members of societies or some groups of society? For instance, in R&D, research and development, then you would have companies, sometimes military organizations, not organizations, space research. Do they actually serve the needs of society? Can we say that on a philosophical level? or do they serve some needs and not necessarily, we do not necessarily know. Who sets the priorities for the allocation of resources for such applied research? Again, if we think about it, and who decides what to do, if anything, with the findings of research? So when we ask ourselves what kind of research should be conducted, in translation studies. What exactly are we talking about? Whose interests are we talking about? Are we interested in the interest of society as a whole, of human society, which would lead us somewhere if we know what research will get us there? Are we talking of the interest of some societies or parts of society which dominate, which has been a claim that has been made in translation studies. I'm going uh, beyond interpreting studies only, also into translation studies. I think you know what I'm referring to. How about those groups which can afford to hire and use translators and interpreters? Or do we just assume that our findings will be put to some good use? Basic research is relatively neutral. I don't think we can say that it is totally neutral because some basic research is closer to some applications than to others. <clears throat> Nuclear physics is closer to some applications than to others. Applied research can be used, okay, to serve purposes, purposes other than those for which it was intended initially. I'm, I'm not saying anything new, I'm just putting things in perspective like control, various types of control, like oppression, like colonization. These are possibilities and there are accusations within the translation studies community that this has been done. So 
when we look at research foci, research results and research effects, we could have a research we, we could have a research project for good a good social cause which can be totally inefficient again as was mentioned I have um, a very good example which I quote quite often of Zubaida Ibrahim's um, doctoral dissertation on court interpreting in Malaysia which describes the situation in a very clear way very convincing way multiple methods, the evidence is there, and there is a solution which is suggested to the authorities. What happened? Nothing. Other action, other than research, like training, funding, lobbying, advertising, or actual translation work could be more efficient to get to the same causes that we want to use. So I think when we talk about research and what it should do and what it does do for society, perhaps we should be humble, at least in translation studies, with respect to the direct effects on translation studies on society. It's difficult to measure what has been done, and a number of people, like Franz, like myself, like other people, have been thinking about this question, does it really matter? And has it mattered? And it's rather difficult to see whether translation studies in any way has really had an effect on society. So would it perhaps be more realistic to be happy with modest expectations regarding practical outcomes? Now, there's another um, distinction that I should like to make between relevant research, perhaps relevant to society, and good research, which is somewhat controversial. And again, I am talking as uh, one very strong supporter of this whole organization that has been set up by Anthony and because I think perhaps, perhaps it is my deep conviction now that the best way I can act to serve any cause would be to be a good trainer of researchers, perhaps more than any research that I would do directly. I will explain. Before doing useful research, I think we need to do good research. And again, I'll explain. Good research with reference to the relevant norms, which are not the same depending on what kind of research we're talking about. You're familiar with that um, distinction that has been made by a number of people, including myself, between so-called liberal, the liberal arts paradigm and empirical research. Research which is not relevant to the needs of society may do very little for society. This is a possibility. But research which is not good as research, and this was mentioned earlier, can be counterproductive, actually counterproductive. Why is it counterproductive? First of all, obviously, it may lead to incorrect conclusions on the topic. If the research is wrong, then you reach evidence, you reach conclusions, findings, and then your findings are wrong. And if they're applied, if they're used, then you understand that this is not very good. It may also discredit the community, which in my view is really what is happening or has been happening for a long time. Who mentioned that earlier? I think, Franz, did you mention this? Or was it Claude Angelelli? That people don't really trust us because the research they have seen coming from translation studies, at least as far as empirical research is concerned, is not very good. Not all of it, of course. And a third problem is that poor research puts academic power in the hands of leaders who are not very competent as researchers. And this may generate problems over many years. Again, I think that you know what I'm referring to, and we can discuss this later if you wish. I think that poor research is still quite frequent in translation studies. 
And I'm not the only one. We have seen a number of, of papers, a number of people who agree on that. And Franz mentioned that it was quite necessary for us to improve our research as well. What is happening, the way I see it, is practicing translators and interpreters who are intellectually capable, no question about that, who are highly motivated too, but who have never been trained into research methods, go into research. So they read a lot, very often, they are very creative, they write well, but they're not rigorous enough. To me, this is the main problem in research and translation studies, not rigorous enough. And this, to me, is the root cause for everything else. Because everything else can be compensated by, if you read, if you gather, if you have more knowledge, you can learn uh, research methods. But being rigorous in one's thinking is really what is missing. And not for lack of intelligence, but because this is not something that we have been trained to implement. Okay, the first immediate question. So who am I to judge? Does Gilles know better? No, Gilles doesn't know better, and Gilles does not claim to know better. But when you read a paper, when you read a thesis or a dissertation, and two or more referees agree, and then more people are asked, and they agree as well, especially when they come from different academic traditions. In other words, one perhaps from philosophy, one from empirical research, one from literary studies, and they all agree, they always say the same thing about something that was done in a piece of research. When the author of the relevant text understands and acknowledges that, I think this is reasonably strong evidence that there is a problem there. This is the basis on which I'm working, not on the basis that I am the one who knows best. I definitely don't think I'm the one who knows best. And uh, whenever I find weaknesses, or what I think are weaknesses, then I ask other people, do you agree, or am I completely wrong? <laughs> Under the circumstances, uh, if you look at priorities for research, I would say my first priority in translation studies, as opposed to other disciplines, is to do research which is likely to enhance research skills before I talk about research which will serve the purposes of society. First of all, I think we need to make sure that we have the good, basic, fundamental skills so that such weaknesses can become rare in translation studies. If there are more people who are trained into rigorous thinking, then I think gradually they will be able to influence everybody else so that the general level will improve. That means that I would go for feasible research, something that is feasible, meaning something that is feasible with the knowledge and the skills available to the student. I wouldn't go straight into corpora uh, training. I wouldn't go straight into linguistic analysis. I wouldn't go right away into complex statistical processing or uh, phonological analysis of uh, all sorts of things like that. I wouldn't start with that. I would start with something simple just to make sure that people have a rigorous way of thinking about things. And when I say with the knowledge and skills available, that would mean also, that would include the help of a colleague, a peer, or a supervisor. If possible, and in a didactic environment, that is when we have people who do research for a thesis, dissertation, graduate school, etc., research with didactic benefits. And this should make it possible to make headway and then conduct more advanced research once the fundamental thinking skills have been acquired. Another idea that I have is that for these reasons and for these purposes, it is easier and perhaps better to start with empirical research. Simple empirical research, but empirical research nevertheless. Let me explain. 
not because I think that empirical research is better in any way than non-empirical research. This is not the point and this is not what I believe. But if there are problems with the rationale, then it is easier to pinpoint them than in non-empirical research. It's something quite similar to what uh, I do with consecutive versus simultaneous. I think that one of the reasons why it's very good to teach consecutive before we teach simultaneous is that in consecutive you can pinpoint specific problems much more easily than in simultaneous. In simultaneous there's a whole array, a whole complex, a whole uh, range of problems that can give exactly the same symptoms, whereas in consecutive you know what is wrong. Empirical research is based on data, and the norms of empirical research include explicit description of the data, of the way they were collected, of the way they were processed, and of the inferences made. So if there are problems, they are more easily detected. This is the reason why I think that it is better to start with empirical research for beginners. I'll give you uh, a few examples from a case study. I have given my own doctoral students in the coursework at ESIT a question, an assignment. Try to find out about interaction between ESIT and other schools of thought in translation studies. What can you tell me about that? So this went over several weeks. We started by discussing how should we go about it, and then we went to a sort into an exercise. So we discussed a number of methodolo methodological options and we reached <clears throat> the conclusion that perhaps <clears throat> we could use citations as an indicator. The idea being that if Ezit authors cite authors from other schools of thought in translation studies, that would be a first indicator for some sort of interaction. If they don't, then we do not have this sort of indication, which doesn't mean there isn't, but then we would, have to, we would have to go into something else. But this was just the beginning. After you have done this, you may perhaps be able to look at numbers, count, categorize, etc. And what happened? How did, how did my uh, doctoral students identify ESIT authors to see whether in their, uh, in their um, papers there were citations of people from outside ESIT. They took somebody because the, world de the word deverbalization appeared in his paper, in the title of his paper, whereas that person had absolutely nothing to do with ESIT. They took a couple of people, including Andrew. You, you will be pleased to know that you are a member, you're an Ezit author, right? Because they published in a, a paper in a collective volume edited by Ezit authors. And they took people who completed a PhD dissertation at Ezit, including people who completed this dissertation 30 years ago. <clears throat> 